Hello, everybody. This is Hard Truths, number seven with Ashton Forbes. This is the podcast where we get to the hard truths. We ask the questions that uh, you don't hear elsewhere on the media. And today, my guest is Timothy Aberino. He is a director, writer, and producer, and investigator. Recently, he has been known for going down to Peru and investigating the Peru um, sightings that have been seen there in some of the villages and some of the towns in that area. So today, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to dig into a little bit of his investigative work. And then we will talk about some spiritual, philosophical, technological uh, considerations for humanity and the evolution of our species. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Mr. Timothy Aberino. Hello, sir. Thank you for coming on Hard Truths today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, Ashton. And thanks you for being here. Uh, first thing I want to say right off the bat is that I appreciate your investigative spirit uh, from looking into you. You're the kind of person that uh, doesn't just accept the information that's been presented to them. You you get their hand, you get your hands dirty. You kind of jump into it, and uh, you know find out what you, you know your own uh, kind of beliefs based on your own experiences. So uh, I want to appreciate that from one investigator to another. And I want to start by asking you what got you interested in um, you know investigating incidents and you know history and uh, all the stuff that you've been doing uh, the past few years and in your life. I would say that my interest in all these topics began when I was 19 years old. I, when I was 18 years old, I dropped out of high school. I moved to the Amazon in Peru. Um, and by the time I was 19, I was, I was living in the Amazon. And that's really when all of this began for me. Um, I had some very interesting experiences, very personal experiences that um, really set the stage for everything that I'm doing now. So I would say that's it goes back to when I was 19 years old. I, uh, I haven't been in the public domain I, I I wasn't in the public domain until about, I would say, maybe 12 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and I, for the last decade or so, I've been uh, traveling around the world investigating all kinds of things, um, I things pertaining to ancient history, uh, lost civilizations, giants, megaliths, and uh, and also uh, ufology, aliens yeah. and UFOs. And what got you interested in the Peru situation? What was, uh, how did you get connected to that? To the, to the one that unfolded this, this summer. Yeah. Um, I was, um, I don't remember exactly how my attention was drawn to that. Probably through social media, I would imagine like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember I, I saw one of the videos that came out of the village of San Antonio de Pintuyacu and, uh, it was uh, alarming. It was a video of the villagers running around at nighttime with flashlights and they were discharging their firearms in the jungle. They were in a state of panic and they were claiming in the video that what they were, what they were confronting was not human one of them said um others were talking about beings or people who were who seemed to be in possession of advanced technology so it was very intriguing uh, the story itself was very intriguing and i i had lived in close to that region of the jungle that's called the alto nanai and i lived for some period in the in the nanai on in the alto nanai but also adjacent to the alto nanai up the river masan north east of the city of Iquitos. This, this particular incident happened in the village of San Antonio de Pintuyacu, which is west, a little bit north and west of the city of Iquitos, but I'm very familiar with that region. I learned to speak Spanish there, and I speak their particular dialect, which is called Charapa, which is a mix of Spanish and Quechua, primarily Spanish. So I kind of cut my teeth in that part of the jungle when I was 19 years old, and so being familiar with the area, it, it, it seemed like uh, it seemed like appropriate for me to go and, and, and conduct this investigation. I waited for a while to see if someone else would go and do it. Um, I had some things going on. And uh, so I was waiting to see if somebody was going to go up there and conduct an, ex an, a, an investigation um, subsequent to the, these incidences which were happening 
from mid July to the beginning of August, uh, two police officers, two Peruvian police officers from the city of Iquitos did go and investigate. They had a Navy escort and um, they conducted what I always describe as a piss poor investigation. It was not very well done. In fact, they walked away with this uh, um, absurd story. They, they literally concocted the story I found out later of these they said that the villagers were being assaulted by by river miners with state-of-the-art jetpacks. And I knew when when that story came out, I knew that that could not be true for, for various reasons. Um, and so it just sort of, it, 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 it created another layer of mystique over this situation that was unfolding in the Peruvian Amazon. And then I saw how the press, both the Peruvian press and the American press, ran with that story and it was just case closed we know that it was you know miners with jet say they are jet packs and nothing to see here anymore let's move on and that really bothered me because i knew that wasn't true so long story short i decided to mount an expedition and i i i chartered a riverboat i was fortunate to have my friend doug thornton who was a, a ex infantry marine dhs operator join me I contacted the village, um, thanks to uh, my colleague, ufologist Ronnie Burnett, helped me get in contact with the village, and I talked to the chief of the village, Yapu, and actually I received an official investigation from the village to go and conduct, the, to conduct my investigation. Uh, I received an official invitation. So um, all, I, I also found out that the, village is, that the village was in dire straits in regard to their supplies. They were running low on supplies because they were not going out into the jungle to harvest uh, from their farms uh, or hunt. They were, were living in a state of terror. They were patrolling their village continually every single night. Um, and, and so we were able to also turn it into kind of a humanitarian effort. And, and we were able to supply thanks to... My friends from Conduit Church, Pastor Darren Tyler and, and, and Jamie Brandenburg and some of the guys from Conduit Church, they helped me co-fund the expedition and we were able to bring them supplies, food and medical supplies and also strategic technology. We brought them because we knew that they were conducting these patrols every night to protect their village from these strange assailants. So we brought them high powered flashlights. We brought them um, we brought them. Uh, thermal binoculars, night vision goggles with recording capabilities, and radios. So, um, and I don't know if you want me just to get into no. what we discovered or... or... So, I, so a couple quick questions on, on some of the stuff that you just mentioned there. First of all, why do you think you're the only person who went to investigate? I mean, I know that the police or whatever did this investigation and came up with this miners with jetpack story, which I'll be honest, I, don't, I think it's absurd as well. I think that uh, you know, it, it, it seems at least as plausible as this idea that there's people with advanced technology in my mind. But, uh, you know, I guess maybe I'm not the normies out there. So what is your thoughts though, on why, you know, why you, why did nobody else go out there and do it? Because I think that that's something I've noticed as well is that, especially in this age of social media, everybody wants to commentate, but nobody wants to get their hands dirty. No one wants to get out there and do the work. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I was kind of surprised when I went to the village, I found out that aside from those two police officers, we were the first people to come and conduct an investigation. Now, there are some interviews floating around online where you have Peruvian journalists interviewing some of the people. They were interviewing the girl Talia, the 15 year old girl who was there was an attempt at abduction. They tried to abduct her. So I had seen these interviews and had and had assumed that these interviews were conducted in the village. Not so. The interviews were conducted in Iquitos. No one had gone to the village. Um, and the reason why no one had gone to the village is because it takes two days to get there up the river. It's very remote. In fact, it's it's pretty much the last village. There's a tiny village associated with the, the village of San Antonio. Um, that's sort of like a satellite village connected to it. But San Antonio de Pintuyacu is the last outpost of civilization before a vast expanse of Amazon jungle. Go, stretching all the way up um, to uh, Ecuador and uh, Colombia in the north. So it's very remote. It's, it's not easy to get to. And, and it's, you know, it's the Amazon. You're deep in the Amazon, so it's not, it's not a very comfortable trip. 
and also add in add in the 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 additional element of danger because you don't know what you're going to find up there. I certainly didn't know if we were going to discover that these were cartels, drug traffickers, human traffickers. We had no idea what we were going to find. So there's an element of danger as well. And I think all of that dissuaded anyone from going and conducting an investigation. Also, you need to speak Spanish and you need, you need at least to be familiar with the dialect or have somebody with you who's familiar with the, with the Charapa to really be able to communicate with these people. So all of those factors, I think, were in, inhibitive of, of other people going in and getting the job done. Awesome. Yeah. And what about you mentioned, uh, you know, the mainstream media is reporting on this as this miners with jetpacks. I and mean, what, what are your feelings in general on the way the media reports incidents like this? And how do you think they could do better in the future? Well, I, I can't believe that the media ran with that story because in the beginning, the Peruvian press was taking this story very, very seriously. It was gravely serious the way that they're reporting it. I was quite surprised. They weren't ridiculing the the the, the uh, villagers. They weren't even doubting the story. It was it was it was creating quite a bit of fear in Peru at the time, um, and trepidation. And so when the when the jetpack story came out, it sort of assuaged everyone's fears, and it it it. it it provided a prosaic answer that I think a lot of people were hoping for. And it, and what really surprised me wasn't that the Peruvian press ran with this explanation, with this concoction. What really surprised me was that the American press ran with it. Even News Nation, who broke the story with David Grush and, and has been very bold in reporting UFO-related stories, just ran with the jetpack miner story. Case closed. Closed. It was miners with state-of-the-art jetpacks with no context, with no understanding of whether or not that is even feasible. Um, they didn't bring in anyone like myself who've, who's lived in the area or v familiar with it, with uh, the Amazon, proving Amazon and the villages. And it, it, it was uh, I was quite surprised and disappointed with the media, even with these alternative media sites like News Nation. So. Uh, I can I can only say that the reason why the American press ran with this story is because that's what the Peruvian press confirmed. Yeah. So um, just as a, a rundown, and I want you to correct me when uh, I kind of go through this a little bit, if there's anything I got wrong here, is that the uh, locals there believe that these were uh, similar to these uh, beings called the face peelers, that these people or whoever was harassing them were on uh, like essentially equivalent of circular hoverboards that seem to have some type of anti-gravitational technology or capabilities. Uh, but they also had some type of boots, I believe, that they were using as perhaps uh, kind of a mechanism to turn it off or on. That there were some advanced aerospace vehicles that were similar to an acorn shape if they were to be turned on their side. And I think I even read something about or saw something about there being some scanning capabilities out there. Um, what do you, I mean, in my opinion, from what I've gleaned from your investigation, these people were terrorized. I think there's no doubt in my mind that people were terrorized out there. What do you think it really was that was going on? Well, the people, the, the communities out there in the jungle, they do believe that this is the face peeler phenomenon, that these are the face peelers. And the face peelers, the face peeler phenomenon is, it's about, it goes back to the 80s, back to the mid 80s. So it's a few decades old. And it, 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 when I lived in the jungle, I heard about the face peelers. And basically, it's sort of an old, it was an old wives tale where they would tell their, their children, for example, don't go out in the jungle at night or the face peelers will get you. And the face peelers, um, they're, they're called face peelers because people every now and again would, would end up missing in the jungle and then they would discover their bodies and they would, they would be missing part of their face. Um, and usually it's very clean cut. So we're not talking about depredation from animals or piranhas or something like that. It's a laser precision. Um, and so this was always, as I said, sort of like an old, a fairy tale, an old wives tale. And, um, but the people in the jungle, absolutely believed it was true. And if you were to ask them, who are the, these face peelers, you, you would get different answers. Basically, one of two answers. Some people are going to tell you they're gringos with advanced technology. And I'm talking about the native communities. They're going to tell you they're gringos with advanced technology that are here or organ harvesting or whatever. And, and 
some people will tell you that they're non-human entities, they're aliens or some sort of non-human creature uh, with advanced technology. So you get a mix of both. And some people tell you that that they think it, it could be both of those things combined. And, and again, when I say some people, I'm talking about the communities themselves. In this case, in San Antonio de, de Pintuyaki, we're talking about the Ikitu tribe. This is a very old Amazonian tribe, very important old Amazonian tribe. The Ikitu language is very interesting. There aren't many people who speak it anymore. Um, and this village had 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 not previ previously experienced an incursion like this or the or the phenomenon, the face peeler phenomenon to this extent, or if ever for that matter. So this was brand new to them, but they were associating associating it with the face peeler phenomenon because uh of the, the attempted abduction of the 15-year-old girl named Talia. And uh, Talia was, a, was, was she, she um, went through this very traumatizing incident in which uh, in, it was a, it was a evening just after dark. She was picking fruit from her tree in her backyard and the fruit fell to the ground. She bent over to pick it up and she felt the gentle breeze at her back and she saw the leaves, the dry leaves rustling around her. And she turned around to see what was causing this breeze, and she saw a, an assailant, a tall person dressed from head to foot in black, in a, in a black armored bodysuit. And he had a helmet on, and the, and the helmet was elongated in the back, and the eyes were sort of, the eye lenses were almond-shaped. Uh, she says sh they were green. Others told me they're yellow. Maybe they're a greenish yellow. And this individual, this assailant, was surfing was surfing on a circular hoverboard platform but there was no noise associated with it she didn't hear anything she felt the breeze um in her backyard there's sort of a golly it's a forested golly there's jungle there and around this little golly this forested golly are other houses so this is in the middle of the village and this individual, this assailant, was surfing around the trees. He comes up the hill, and he lands right behind her, and he grabs her from behind, and he puts his hand over her mouth. And, and, as, and as this is happening, she notices another guy coming up, the same, same equipment, black armor bodysuit, elongated helmet. He comes up the hill. He lands in front of her and grabs her feet. And then they proceed to carry her over behind this, this thatch roof chicken coop that's in her backyard. And, and they, long story short, without going into all the details, they proceeded to, to cut her face off. They took out a, uh, what I think is a laser syringe, the way she describes it. And they began to make an, inc an incision right here below her jawline. And uh, she started to struggle and they dropped her. They were holding her. They dropped her because she started to push up on one of the masks on one of the helmets behind her. And as she's pushing up on the helmet, he let her go for a minute to try and pull his helmet down. And she screamed. And all of the neighbors came running with flashlights because they were already in a state of vigilance. This wasn't the first incursion. This was the first attempt at abduction in San Antonio de Pintuyaco, but it was not the first incursion into the village. So all the villagers were in a state of of vigilance and they were sitting on their porches their patios with their shotguns and their flashlights at the very least their flashlights so when she screamed the moment she screamed her brother and the neighbors came running and i talked to them they saw these assailants floating on these hoverboards and by the time they got there they were they were dragging talia by her hair one of them and they dragged her up the hill a little bit. And when they saw that they were surrounded by the villagers, they, they maneuvered on their boards to where there was an opening in the trees. And then they shot up in the sky. And uh, Talia, Talia was left bloodied and, and unconscious. Um, it is important to note that Talia, there was an anomaly. And in, in, I, I interviewed many people in the village, probably 30, 40, 50 people in the village. And Talia... She had a detail that I didn't hear from anyone else. She said that she heard the assailants speaking. One of them spoke in broken Spanish with a, with a gringo accent, and the other one spoke like a Peruvian. They were both tall. She said they were both taller than me. One of them was, was exceptionally tall. She calls him the gringo because he had the broken accent. 
speaking in Spanish, and the other one she called the Peruvian because he was shorter and he spoke like her. And she heard them, for example, when they were, before they cut her neck, before they began to make this incision, they took out a cream and they mixed this cream with some powder and they, well, they shot it up her nose uh, with, a, with a nasal syringe. And this sort of put her in an altered state of consciousness. And then they took out another, they took out another tube of cream and they began to smear it all over her face and it made her face go numb before they began to cut it. And she, she said she heard them, the one saying to the other, be careful, don't put too much on her face. It'll ruin the flesh. And she said what they meant was that it would make it difficult for this, to, to separate the skin from the tissue beneath. And so she says she heard them speaking. Now, Talia was very traumatized. She had severe PTSD and was trembling like a leaf the entire time I was talking to her. She very, very traumatized young lady. Um, so I don't know if she actually heard them speaking or if she confabulated them speaking. I don't know. But if they're speaking Spanish, especially broken Spanish, then these are human beings. Maybe something a little more interesting than that, but, but very likely human beings. Um, and you mentioned this technology that they have. So apart from the apart from these hoverboards, which are not, this is not conventional technology. We're not talking about uh, pro propellers. This is not propellers. There's some other kind of technology here, unconventional technology, because it's silent and, and it's, it just does not conform to the propeller technology, the, the drones that people surf on that you can find online. Um, and apart from that, they also have, they're also in possession of what I would describe as advanced aerospace vehicles. You mentioned they, they, they look like, um, they look like, acorns on their side so they're 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 narrower in the front and they and they widen out in the back these vehicles they're about the size of a small aircraft like a private jet or a large helicopter like a chinook or a black hawk helicopter but they're completely silent except for when they move away they make a low frequency humming sound um I had various villagers draw these craft in the dirt for me. They all drew the same thing. And, and one individual who had a really remarkable story, he drew the craft on an acrylic board for me. And this individual, he was pulling, pulling up his nets at 3 a.m. and it was pitch black outside. And suddenly he said it was like someone turned the lights on or the sun came up. It was everything was illuminated around him. And he was looking at the water and he saw there's something bright above him. So he looks up and he sees this craft, this acorn shaped craft. He's looking straight up at it. It has, it does not have any wings. It doesn't have any propellers, any propulsion, to, any propulsion systems to speak of. It has these little nubs in the place of wings, like rounded uh, protrusions that as he was observing this craft, those nubs opened up. They, they opened up and they deployed, a, there was a series of lights as if it was scanning. And it, it was there for quite, a, for quite a while, at least like a minute or two. He's looking at this craft. And, and, and what was really interesting about his testimony, testimony was the craft that he saw was transparent. He said it had like a sort of a mesh uh, fuselage, like some sort of mesh-like material that you could see through. And in fact, he saw two people inside. He saw somebody like in the cockpit area and another person sitting in the middle. And again, multiple villagers described this craft to me and they saw it. They would, they all saw it about, you know, 30, 40 feet above their head. In some cases it was just hovering above some of the houses in the village. And in this case it was hovering, hovering above the river. And so obviously, whoever these assailants are, are in possession of unconventional advanced technology. There's no question about it. This is not propellers. By the way, the people in this village, this village is unique. San Antonio de Pintuyaco is unique because there's a, there's a communications outpost that the provincial government built in, in, in the village. And that communications outpost has, a, has an internet satellite uplink. And so if you go there in the evening, you're going to find some of the villagers sitting in the, in the government building watching movies on YouTube or whatever. Uh, so these guys are not uninformed. They're very much aware of pop culture. They know exactly what helicopters are. They see military hel helicopters from time to time flying around because they're going out there to uh, run missions against the uh, drug traffickers. 
And so they, they know what a helicopter is. They know what it sounds like. They know what planes are. Planes routinely fly over the village, a uh, small aircraft, um, you know, like Cessna planes. Um, they watch movies. They, they, watch all the, they watch all the same movies we do, the Marvel movies and all this. They, they know what a propeller is. They know what a jet engine is and sounds like. And so when they're describing the technology, it's not like, you know, uh, ignorant native people who are describing an, a conventional airplane, but they don't know how to describe it. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. These people are as informed with pop culture. They know what the world looks like as much as we do. They're using internet. They have social media accounts. So um, that's important to to, uh, to delineate that because you know, some people may say, well, these they're probably just seeing a helicopter and they think it's, you know, they don't understand what they're looking at. That is not the case. I can assure everyone they are describing advanced aerospace vehicles, unconventional technology without question. Yeah. People love their prosaic explanations too, right? They love to come up with something. Oh, it's some balloons. It's a helicopter. It's Chinese lanterns, really anything except for something that may be uncomfortable to people in general. So a couple just kind of clarification points on that. One question that I, I'm not sure if you got an answer to is, did they say when they were scanning this, this uh, I'm going to just call it a UFO because that's, I guess, what it is by technicality. Um, did they say what color the lights were when they were scanning by any chance? Yes, he did. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the video. But I rem if I recall, I want to say they said blue, red, and white, I think. Mm. Okay. I think they were consistent. The colors were consistent on the on the boards because the the discs had had a series of lights around them too. In fact, when these incursions would begin, when these episodes would begin, where these assailants would come into their village, it would begin by them seeing these like saucers flying around in the sky silently, just flying around, hovering over the village. Mm -hmm. But if they were to take their flashlight and put it in, and flash up at the saucer, if it was close enough, they'd see the silhouette of a person on top. Right. So so these guys were are, are, are floating above are flying around above the village on these saucers and the saucers have the capability to completely stop, you know, to be stationary in the air with no sound. And then the assailants would go land in the jungle between the openings in the trees and they would either walk into the village or some of the villagers told me a few of the men told me they were floating. And I said, you mean on the discs? And they said, no, no. They were just floating off of their shoes. They have these, they have these little discs on the bottom of their shoes that project a light, and they can float like a meter off the ground. A few guys told me this. In fact, one of the guys said, he said, listen, I was standing here. I went to all the locations, right, where they were encountering these guys, and they walked me through the encounters. He said, I was standing here, and it was just after dark, and I had my flashlight, and I saw one of them here. I put my flashlight on him, and he was right there in front of me, and I'm telling you, he was floating. On He had discs on the bottom of his shoes, not to, not to be con, uh, confused with the, with the, uh, with the uh, hoverboard discs. Like, I'm talking about two discs on the bottom of, his, on their, of their boots or footwear. And he said he was just floating there, and I, he said, I shot him point-blank range. With, the, with with my 16 gauge shotgun and he fell back on his back so the blast knocked him back but then he just hopped back up in the air resumed floating and moved away and the, and the guys tell me that when they would shoot these to shoot the assailants they would hear the the shotgun bbs dinking off of their body armor um and they set up traps around the village as well they set these traps up, they take these tubes and they put a shotgun cartridge in it and they have a firing mechanism, like a hammer mechanism when the rope is triggered. And they use it. They use these traps to catch small game, but they modified them. They modified the birdshot and they melt the birdshot down and they make they make uh, bigger BBs. So they make slugs out of them. Right. And they made these slugs. They modified the birdshot. So each each canister uh, had. A, a few slugs in it, maybe four slugs in it, and they raised up the they raised the traps up so that they would be the level of the knee at the, at the knee height, right? To try and literally take these guys out at the knees with these traps, and it, and they told me that they would hear they set nine of them up they would hear the traps going off at night, 
And then wow. they'd go to check them. They'd go check them out, and and the traps were triggered, and they would see the footprints of the assailants, which were two discs on each side, so two circles. That's what, and they were very large. They said the footprints, but but there was no blood. There was no shrapnel. Almost as if these guys were just triggering the traps for fun, right? These uh, assailants. Um, in fact, these traps are very dangerous. One of the ladies accidentally walked into one and it blew a hole in her thighs previous to our visit. Wow. So anyway, um, we're dealing with, you know, a physical phenomenon and uncon unconventional technology that I, I know and I, that I can convert, confirm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I have no difficult time believing in advanced technology. My personal opinion, which I've put out there, is that I absolutely believe that there is advanced technology that's out there that's unknown to the vast majority of the world in general. So am I correct in assuming that your opinion then is that these were humans with advanced technology and this is not aliens or anything like that? And then what would you say their motive then is? Are they trying to harvest people or just terrify people? Um and then lastly, how long do you think this uh, was going on? I think I heard that there hasn't been any more incidents since you went there. But if you can clarify any of that, feel free. I cannot say for certain who the assailants are. If, in fact, they spoke broken Spanish, one of them, as Talia, according to Talia's testimony, then we're dealing with humans. Um, and we're probably dealing with a, a mix of gringos and, and locals, local maybe paramilitary guys, um, we could be dealing with a mix. We could be dealing with a, a, a cooperation, a co-op between human and non-human factions. Of course, that, that seems fantastical, but it, it is within the realm of possibility considering the kind of technology on display in these incidents. Um, it, 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 it's definitely not miners with jetpacks. It's not cartels. And this is simply by way of logical deduction. If the if the Sinaloa cartel, for example, in Mexico had the kind of technology that's being de deployed in the jungle of, of Peru, we would see it. They wouldn't hesitate to use it. They would certainly use it against the Mexican military. There's they 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 have the cartels have military weapons grade ammunitions. There's no question about it. They have weapons grade equipment. Uh, military weapons grade equipment, but they don't have advanced aerospace vehicles. They don't have anti-gravity -gravi technology. They don't have the kind of stuff that uh, these villagers are encountering. Um, so there are aspects of this phenomenon that seem very human to me. For example, aside from this village, I also in I, I investigated a couple other incidents, one in um, the, the city, not village, city of Nauta, 30, 35, 36,000 inhabitants. And the reason why that is important, that detail, is because a lot of people are out there saying that these are cartels or miners who are just trying to drive the, these villagers off their land in the jungle so that they can harvest gold or something like that. But we know that's not true because there were the same, the same sort of phenomena, a phenomenon was taking place in the city of Nauta which is a couple hours down the river towards Iquitos, 35, 36,000 inhabitants, they're not going to drive those people off their land. That's obviously not the purpose here. That's not the objective is to drive 35,000 inhabitants out of a jungle city. These people have been there for, for centuries. And that's just illogical. Something else is going on. They're after something else. And... I, I talked to a, a, a man named Pablo, a young man named pa Pablo from a different village in a different part of the of Peruvian Amazon. Uh, it's southwest of the village of San Antonio de Pintuyacu, and it's near the city of Yurimaguas. And this individual, they encountered the same phenomenon. They saw the guys on the discs, black armored bodysuits, elongated helmets, same dudes, right? And this guy said he was taking a bath in the river and suddenly heard, he heard people yelling, uh, pelacadas, pelacadas, face peelers, face peelers. And he comes running out. He's got a towel around his waist. He grabs his flashlight and his shotgun and he be begins to pursue a couple of these guys on foot. They're running through the jungle. He's running behind them and he gets close enough. He shoots. He discharges his shotgun and he hits one. And again, he hears the dinking off of their off of their body armor. But he said, I think I hit their propulsion system, whatever it is, which is probably in 
in their shoes. Um, these guys were not on the disc. They were just running into the, the, the these guys were, by the way, they might have exoskeletons. They might have exosuits uh, as well um, because they're all, all described as being inhumanly agile, the way they can move through the jungle. So I'm thinking maybe, maybe we're dealing with exosuits here. Um, but he shot one of them and he must have hit the propulsion system because this guy, this assailant, was having a hard time lifting up into the air. And so Pablo, when he saw that this guy's having a hard time getting off the ground, he charged him and he tackled him. He grabbed, he got him around the waist. And as soon as he grabbed the guy around the waist, and he said the guy was lifting off of the ground as he's holding him, and he's holding him down. And he said that the, this, this face peeler guy, he took out this, he said it was like a mini flashlight, he said it was a laser, and he hit him with the laser, and Pablo instantly went unconscious. And his dad and, and some of the other guys um, found him and, and, and revived him. And, and since, since that incident, he's had heart troubles. So um, it's a very, this is a very tactile, tangible phenomenon. That smacks, that, that seems to me to be a, 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 a human encounter. Um, but, but I can't say for sure. It, it, my working hypothesis is we're dealing with, we're dealing with human, very nefarious human beings in possession of advanced technology. What are they doing? What are they harvesting? Well, apparently they are trying to harvest faces because there was a boy near the city of Nauta who previous to our visit uh, was, was rescued. In the same sort of scenario, um, he unfortunately sustained deep lacerations on both sides of his neck. Very, very gruesome. Uh, I posted that video on my Twitter account and it's hard to find online where it's not blurred. I found the one where it's not blurred and very, very gruesome, very deep. He almost died. He almost bled out. They were able to rush him to the hospital in Nauta. They saved his life. Um, and he says it was a face peeler assault. And that's what everybody says. So, so are these the face peelers of, you know, of legend in the jungle or are, are or is this a group of individuals who want everyone to think they're face peelers as cover for something else that they're doing? I, I tend to think that because with all this technology that they obviously have, why is it so difficult for them to accomplish the mission and harvest faces? Um, I feel like they just want to scare people and they want, they want the people to think that they're the face peelers of legend when in fact something else is going on. There's a different operation underway in the jungle that, and they don't want people to, to catch wind of that. They want everyone to think that this is the face peeler phenomenon. That's sort of my working hypothesis. However, having said that, um, in the city of Nauta, I found out that the people of Nauta who experienced the same phenomenon, the guys on the discs dressed in black, uh, they also had flying saucers hovering over their village. So, you know, the typical saucer. So that's, that's what makes me wonder if, some, if there's some sort of a cooperation happening here between human, nefarious human and non-human forces, entities. Again, that sounds fantastical, but, um, but it's, it's within the realm of possibility, at least as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I like to keep my mind open uh, to any possibility in general out there, especially related to this UFO phenomenon. I mean, if we have anti-gravitational tech and other technology that uh, can do stuff that we consider to be magic, then I think we really have to consider all possibilities. And so that's why I, I really like your investigation, because, you know, you've considered all avenues. You clearly seem to be going into this with an open mind, uh, not really with necessarily any bias. What I would say is, have you seen, uh, you know, you've done other types of investigations, you've traveled potentially the world. Have you ever seen anything similar like this ever before? Yes, I have actually. Brook Park, Ohio. I, I grew up in Brook Park, Ohio um, and moved away, went and lived in Peru. And then I came back to live for a short period of time. Brook Park is a suburb of Cleveland, the city of Cleveland. I came and I was living in Cleveland for a couple of years before I moved out to Montana after living, having lived for a decade in the Amazon in, in, um, in Peru. Um, and when I was living during this period of time that I was living in Brook Park, I was in my 30s, early 30s, actually my late 20s. Um, I, to give a little background here, I, I would often walk over to my, my brother-in-law's house, Tony, 
and he and I would lift weights in his basement together. And the topic of our conversation was more often than not related to UFOs, aliens, reverse engineered technology, crash retrievals, this sort of thing. Bob Lazar, you know, Element 115. This was the topic of our conversation most of the time. And in fact, there was one particular evening where we were talking about these things and my brother wanted to run over to, to the GNC store and buy some supplements and it was going to close soon. So we decided to jump in the car. It was in February. I don't remember the date. It was in February. It was very cold, very windy. We jumped in my car. We drove over to the suburb of Brook Park, again, where I grew up, to the Brookgate shopping, uh, the strip mall, the Brookgate shopping strip mall. And... Um, it was around, I know the store was closing like at 9 or 9.30 and we were, it was probably like 8.45 or something or approaching 9 when we arrived. And as we're approaching the, the Brookhead shopping complex, uh, we saw something hovering, like a craft hovering over the building on the corner of the complex. It was just hovering there. And our first thought was that the National Guard is running a, a, a training exercise because there's a National Guard base not far from there. And so that was our first thought. And uh, we instinctively, we rolled down the windows of the car because we thought we would we would hear that telltale sound of blades whipping through the air, right, for helicopters. Because these were obviously large helicopters, whatever it was. It was a Chinook or a Blackhawk or something like that. We heard nothing. And so we looked at each other like, okay, this is something interesting. I pulled into the parking lot. There was hardly anybody there because all the stores were closing and it was very cold. I just pulled in the middle of the parking lot, threw the car into park because this craft that was hovering over the corner store, it, it, it lifted off higher into the air and it just turned very gently on its axis, began to move toward me. And then it moved above and a little bit in front of my car and began to descend. It got about 30 or 40 feet max above my car. And it just hovered there. And it was shaped, it's sort of, it sort of had a, a delta shape. No, not delta, like a diamond shape to it. I don't remember exactly. It definitely came to sort of a, a rounded point in the front. And it had the stubby protrusions on the side. It didn't have wings. It had these stubby protrusions, just like they described in... Uh, in San Antonio Pintuyaku. In fact, it, maybe it was the same thing. It might have been the very same kind or, or something similar to that aerospace vehicle that they were describing in the in the jungle. I had a good long look at it. It had um, it had sort of a, a, a angular uh, body armor, like um, a grayish gr a, a, like a grayish green. It was hard to tell. It was nighttime. It sort of had like a grayish green angular body armor, much like the the uh, F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighter. Um, but it wasn't shaped like the stealth fighter, didn't have wings, but it had sort of that angular body armor. And it, it had these triangle lights. They were triangles and they were white. And it had a series of, of I believe, blue and green lights around the fuselage. And the thing was just hovering there completely silently. It was about the size of a large helicopter. No. No propulsion system to speak of, no propellers, no engines, nothing, completely silent. It was so windy that night that my car was shaking back and forth like this with the gusts of wind, right? This thing was completely unmoved, as if it was in its own gravitational bubble, as if it was in, as if it was in its own atmosphere, completely unmoved. And we, we got a good long look at this thing. I could have hit it with a rock. It was that close to my car. And ultimately, I had a flip phone back then. My, my brother-in-law had a, had a smartphone. And so I, I said, Tony, your phone, your phone. And, and he sort of shook his head like he was coming out of a daze. And he started to, to feel for his phone. And he found it in his pocket. He started to pull it out. And he dropped it. And when he dropped it on the floor, he's fumbling it for it because it's dark in the car. He grabs it, picks it up, you know, trying to pull up his camera. And when he gets it up like this, the, the craft just lifts up into the air and starts to move away. And we jumped out of the car, and it was so cold and windy, we couldn't believe that this thing was just smoothly gliding away. No sound, no propulsion system. So is that what these guys saw in the jungle? Is that what the villagers of San Antonio, and other villages, by the way, uh, were encountering? It very well may be. The stubby protrusions in the place of wings really stood out to me in their testimony, because that's what I saw. So I know 
without a shadow of a doubt that somebody has advanced unconventional aerospace technology without a shadow of a doubt. Unconventional, no propellers, no jet engines. It's using a different kind of physics. There's a different, there's different laws of physics that we haven't, you know, that even the physics professors at Harvard have no idea exists. There's, there's exotic elements like element 115 that Bob Lazar talks about that don't come from planet Earth that we can't reproduce that have anti-gravitational properties in that and can create antimatter, for example. So um, I think awesome. these craft are creating a sort of like a gravity bubble around them. They're within their own atmosphere. They're probably projecting gravity waves, generating gravity waves. Like Bob Lazar said, there's pro probably time dilation going on when you get close to them because when you distort gravity, uh, you're distorting space time. And so you know, all of this technology seems to be uh, have the same properties that uh, the, that I encountered, that the that the villagers are encountering. In that they're silent, in that they can hover in place without propellers and so forth. Yep. Yeah, and if uh, it makes you feel any better, I mean, this is just my own uh, testimony and opinion. Is that you're absolutely right? There are crafts out there that are defying gravity. I think that either the military industrial complex or third party contractors or both have this technology and. I think that they're potentially hiding it from us. Um, before we move on to the I think next topic. Hiding. I think they're yeah. absolutely hiding it from us. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got off the phone with a congressman, uh, one of the congressmen that was that was in the briefing the other day. And, and there's no question that this stuff is being ob obfuscated. Um, it, there's so many layers of compartmentalization. The you, you said it right. The military industrial complex, what we call the deep state. I call it the dump. I call the the level of security. The the let's say that the echelon of the national security apparatus that 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 has the technology that's been working with that technology I refer to it not as the deep uh, deep state but as the dumb state because it's deeper than the dumb state and of course when I say dumb I'm referring to the deep underground military bases because that's where these things are being developed and the members of Congress even the president does not have clearance to go into these bases. And that's where this technology is being developed. The S-4 facility, for example, where Lazar worked, had multiple underground levels. And there's no question in my mind that, that this element of the military-industrial complex, together with certain aerospace companies, military con defense contractors, aerospace companies, have been, have been recovering and reverse engineering reverse engineer non-human aerospace vehicles let's call them alien craft and recovering the bodies and probably interfacing with the entities that were alive in some cases uh, from these crash retrievals i have absolutely no problem believing that i think that 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 is a factual statement and i think as the as so in other words i'm affirming uh, Grush's testimony, and as we move forward, I think it's going to become more and more apparent that that apparent that that is exactly what has been going on and what is going on. And here's the problem: I think that the people who are in possession of this technology, who who have this, let's call it secret science and technology, are not very good people. I think some of the most nefarious human beings on the on the face of the planet are the ones who are in possession of this technology. Yep. And so before we go on to that, because that's actually leading to my next point, I just also want to thank you for your humanitarian efforts, for helping out the, these small towns and villages, right? I, I know that you brought equipment to them, medical supplies, et cetera. Like, if nothing else, like you're actually out there and you're doing humanitarian work. So just thank you very much, sir, for doing that. And then I, I also want to say that I'm also in full agreement with everything you just said regarding these third-party contractors, regarding David Grush's testimony. I think that people that speak to Congress under penalty of perjury should be given us our highest level of attention. I think that the people that are trying to debunk him and say that he's making stuff up are really just doing humanity a disservice. So the question I would ask you along those lines is, what does disclosure actually mean to you? You know, If you had to define what disclosure means to you, what, what would you say it is? Disclosure is what we're seeing happen right now. It's, it's, it's not, I mean, it can mean anything really. It's in, in, in simple terms, disclosure is the revelation from an official source. So, so NASA or the Pentagon or the Pope, uh, revelation from an official source that, that, 
that we have evidence of the existence of of extraterrestrials or non-human entities. I mean, that ultimately is disclosure, but that can happen in many different ways. That's the most straightforward way, which will probably not ha happen for a long time, if ever. But the there are there are other manifestations of that process that can happen and are indeed happening. For example, I think that since 2017, the Pentagon has been desperately trying to control the narrative, the, the, the so-called UAP narrative, because they cannot, they have no power. The Pentagon, the deep state, they have no power to control the phenomenon. They cannot control the phenomenon. All they can control is our perception of it. So they're desperately trying to control the narrative and they're they're losing control to some extent because there's too many encounters now. Uh, there's too many encounters by our, our airmen, our, our, our Navy guys, you know, the Nimitz incident, the go fast incident, the gimbal incident. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of these. Everybody's got cell phones. People talk. It used to be back in the 90s, 80s and 90s that if you were a threat and you were coming out with information, they would just kill you. They would just kill you. Um, that's not the case anymore. Now they just discredit you. It's easier to discredit you than to kill you at this point. Um, and so that's that's there's there's been a switch in the the a, an adjustment to that modus operandi by the deep state, by the dumb state, in that they're no longer just killing people who are getting too close to the truth. They're, they just discredit them. It is so easy to discredit people because of social media and the internet and everything it's it's much or they blackmail you um uh, or, or they threaten you like they did to david grush uh so uh, they can only control the narrative they cannot control the phenomenon and so what we're seeing now is a managed leak we're seeing a managed leak of information they don't want this information to come out but it's coming out so they're trying to control it they're trying to control the pace of how it's leaked a good example of that is you know, the, the Pentagon was dragging its heels when these congressmen were trying to get David Grush in a skiff in that secure environment that, that, so they can brief him directly. There were so many questions that he was asked during the hearing that he had to say, well, I, I, I can't tell you that in this public setting, but I'm, I'm glad to share that information with you in a skiff. And we're talking about questions pertaining to alien bodies, right? Not not just um, prosaic things. We're talking about the most important questions. He's willing to tell them, but he doesn't want to go to jail. So he'll tell them in this secure uh, environment. And that had to be approved by various levels of authorities, you know, uh, in, in government, including at the Pentagon. And so what did the Pentagon do? They knew that Grusha's security clearance was expiring. So all they did was drag their feet until his clearance expired. And then and then the whole thing of a skiff is sort of irrelevant, right? Because he doesn't have a security anymore. So so they're managing this leak. They're managing the narrative the best they can. They're scrambling to do it. They're probably injecting a lot of misinformation and disinformation um, to confuse, to throw out red herrings so people get off of the... They, they want us not to be focused on, uh, and whenever I talk to uh, anyone involved in government on the committees and stuff, this is what I tell them. They, they want to keep you unfocused. They don't want you to focus on the two things that Grush, the two claims that Grush made that everybody should be laser focused on, and that is crash retrievals of non-human craft, right, of quote-unquote spacecraft and, and the non-human biologics that are associated with those crash retrievals. That right there is what the deep state, the dumb state does not want us to know about or think about or see anything related to. Um, yeah. They, they, any, you know, Grush gave the coordinates for the, some of these bases where he believes that they're, that these secret um, special access programs are being developed to have been underway. That was months ago that we heard that he had the coordinates, that he had given those coordinates to the inspector general. Do you think there's any craft in any of those locations anymore? They scrubbed them clean. Yeah. They're gone. They're, they moved them to some other base. So it's going to be a cat and mouse game for Congress to try and get, get, any, get, get access to any of these facilities. And when they do, everything's going to be gone. So, it, it, so this is a long winded answer to your question. We are witnessing some degree of disclosure happening right now. The government, the Pentagon, 
confirmed that the GoFast, the Gimbal, the, um, the Tic Tac, and a handful of other videos were authentic. Okay, That is a tacit admission that the UFO phenomenon is real. That's a tacit admission. The controversy is over. The UFO phenomenon is real. And it is, and at least some of it does not have a human origin. This, I think, has all been tacitly admitted by the Pentagon at this point. No, I agree with you 100%, sir. And I especially agree about your point about disinformation and how easy it is in today's society to push disinformation. People have even been pushing about me. And I just came onto this scene a few months ago regarding all of this. And, you know, people listen and this idea that people just adopt other people's beliefs because of peer pressure and the age of social media where information gets around. It's been incredible to behold just from a firsthand account. You know, one thing that I would challenge uh, your view on, although I, I still agree with you, is that, you know, you've got this uh, non-human intelligence alien bodies that are being disclosed via Grush as well as crash retrievals. But if we were to take it back to, you know, the um, investigation you did in Peru, doesn't that lend itself more to the like the technology being kind of what the thing is that's really being disclosed? Because in my mind, when I think of the military industrial complex, I think that what they care about isn't, OK, well, aliens are here or whatever. Sure, that's going to blow people's minds. Um, you know, the technology will have socioeconomic impacts. But what about the national security impacts? Right. Like that's the part where I wonder about what is your thoughts on this idea that this technology could lead to if you were to adapt it? Doomsday weapons, weapons of mass destruction that well, no, make nukes look like nothing. Go ahead. There's no question about it. And th there are legitimate concerns by the by the national security state. The last thing we want is and make no mistake about it. China has their own programs. Russia has their own programs. But the last thing we want is for them to get ahead of us with any of this technology, because I don't think China would hesitate to use it. Um, and I don't think we would either under certain circumstances or Russia. And I believe from what I've heard, I have no way to confirm this, but it is my, it's my personal opinion. And, and again, I think this is a, an informed speculation that our programs are quite a bit advanced compared to the other programs from other nations. They have stuff and maybe in certain aspects, they've maybe made some headway that we haven't been able to, but we're a little bit more advanced. Uh, we've been doing it longer and, they just weren't china wasn't in a position to reverse engineer anything in the 40s neither was russia was until the collapse of the soviet union and then there was no money for those programs anymore so whatever advancements they made were uh, came came to a halt until they were able to rebuild their country so that gave us an advantage and we certainly got way front uh, probably the united kingdom with whom we share maybe some of this uh technology with we probably don't share much of it with anyone, and I'm not sure that we should. But so there are some legitimate national security concerns here. Um, there's, there, I'm sure even if we were to have disclosure, there probably are certain things that shouldn't be disclosed. Um, that should be, you know, some information that the, that the U.S. military should hold close to its vest. But the, but the disclosure of the, I'm going to call it, the alien presence is does not in and of itself cause these are already aware of this this is nothing new to them so the fact that that is being hidden that's against us that they're hiding that from us the citizens they're not hiding that from china they're not hi hiding that from russia they're hiding that from us so why? Why are they doing that? There are, there, there, there are only, in my mind, in my estimation, there are only uh, nefarious reasons why they would hide that information from the general public. And, and those reasons, I'm sure, um, have to do with the kinds of technologies that would become available to all of us and that, would, that, would, that we would demand would become available to all of us. If we were to find out that, yes, there is an extraterrestrial presence and yes, or let's say a non-human presence at the very least. And yes, there is uh, exotic technology that would totally transform, revolutionize our society if it were made available to the public. And there are vested interests that don't want that to ha happen. No, none of these big corporations 
corporations that make all of their millions and billions of dollars using conventional technology want unconventional technology in the market. They would have to completely retool. It would destroy their business model. It would destroy their, their business altogether. If there was free energy, for example, um, if, if we found out, which I think is absolutely the case, that combustion technology, combustion engines are, 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 are basically extremely primitive at this point compared to, compared to what we could be using, the airline industries would become irrelevant overnight unless they could upgrade and, and integrate the technology. Um, I mean, you know, why are we all flying around in these tubes still with jet, with, with jet propulsion? Obviously, somebody has possession of, of some kind of anti-gravitational technology. I don't think there's any question about it. So why are we all jamming ourselves into tubes with jet, with, with, uh, with uh, you know, jet propulsion? These industries would have to be transformed. And so there's going to be both national security concerns from the, the government sector, but then there's going to be private concerns, private interests that are, are going to push back against the revelation of an extraterrestrial presence and, and, and uh, advanced technology, unconventional technology. There are a lot of interests mm -hmm. involved here, but everyone should understand that, that, the, that the, the revelation of an extraterrestrial pre presence, a, a non-human presence, an alien, which I think is the most accurate term, an alien presence, is, n is no revelation to China or Russia, to their governments. That's no revelation to them. That's, that's not telling them something they don't already know. So that information is specifically being kept from us, the citizenry. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to just go ahead and agree. What you said there actually is uh, pretty much perfectly in sync with what Dr. Stephen Greer told me in a Twitter space uh, several weeks ago as well as uh, the idea that some of the technology should be held back for national security purposes, that, you know, there's no reason why we can't reveal some of this information that uh, I also agree with you that China and Russia are probably just behind the United States. I think that we have probably military supremacy of the world and we just don't want to let people know about that in general. Um, and I think that my personal opinion is that some of the reason why it doesn't get disclosed is that I just think that from the uh, popularity perspective, I don't think a lot of people are ready for it. Right. I think that there's a certain percentage that are I think that you and I are probably the people watching this, but a significant number of people out there that wouldn't believe it to be real, even if alien wind talked to Joe Biden personally on the front lawn of the White House. Um, but on a different note or slightly similar note. I would ask you now, knowing about this type of technology, uh, presuming that it's real, and I th certainly think it is, and I can tell that you think it is as well, does this make you more or less spiritual in general? I don't think it bears upon my spirituality. Let me say one thing. Let me let me back up and say one thing. Yeah, sure. There's another reason why. There's another reason why this is being kept from the public. Two words: alien abduction. That's a huge reason why it's being kept from the pub, being kept from the public. That's a that's a there's skeletons in that closet. They don't want you to open that closet. So, um, in regard to this affecting my let's my spirituality, or I'm 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 a I'm a Christian, um, and and none of this none of this has any kind. It does no damage. Let's say to my. Christian worldview whatsoever. The revelation of like gray aliens, I'm absolutely convinced gray aliens exist. Um, if we're to find out that human beings have been interfacing with extraterrestrial entities since our genesis, uh, that, that, that does not conflict whatsoever with my understanding of the scriptures. Rather, it confirms what I already know from the scriptures, that human beings have been interfacing with non-human entities since our genesis. And furthermore, these are extraterrestrial entities unquestionably that pre-exist us so that is well within the biblical paradigm and so none of this as i said does does damage to 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 my perspective as a christian yeah and that, you know that's interesting to me because um the more i've learned about this uh, technology the more spiritual i've actually become because of i i guess you were already there at that point but there's this idea out there, these narratives that, oh, we don't disclose this because religious people will like not be able to reconcile it. I think that's just completely false. I think that from the religious aspect, it completely aligns with this idea of a construct creator, et cetera. Even aliens, I don't think 
really uh, harm that view at all. I think it's the people that uh, don't have any religious beliefs that are the ones that are going to be the hardest to, to believe this information because they're sitting there believing everything they see on TV and, you know, all the whatever the authority tells them. And then they find out, oh, nope, that's all been a lie your whole lives. Like those are the people who I feel are threatened. But that's just my opinion. Um, you know, on the same kind of line, I guess, with, we're talking about technology or do you want to say something related to that? I uh, just I agree with that assessment The 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 maybe maybe in the 40s and 50s, there would have been a disruption in regard to the the religious community. But the America, for example, the the, the fastest growing religion is no religion, secular secularism, atheism, humanism. So that narrative is is no longer relevant. It, it's just no longer relevant. And, and I think there are plenty of Christians like myself who understand that the revelation of, an, of extraterrestrial beings, uh, as I keep saying, would, would, would not conflict with our worldview whatsoever. So it's, it's really become irrelevant. There's other reasons why that revelation is not happening. Awesome. So uh, and then I've only got a couple more questions for you in general, and I appreciate your time. Um, so what do you think the trajectory of human evolution is here, given that this advanced technology may be real? Do you think that we this is a risk of us destroying ourselves? Do you think that we could become obsolete and machines take over? What's your view in general of what what does this all lead to, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, five years from now, whatever? In regard to the development of this technology? Yeah, and just human evolution in general, um, and, and from either a spiritual, technological, or whatever aspect you want to look at it from. Well, I predict that we are heading towards a post-human future. I write about this in my book, Birthright, uh, the coming post-human apocalypse and the usurpation of Adam's dominion on planet Earth. I think we're heading for a post-human apocalypse. The future is definitely post-human. And that is uh, a very dangerous prospect, obviously, for the human species. Um, we, the, all of these technologies that we hold, for example, the, you know, the, the, the cell phones, the, te the technology that we hold in our hands is going to ultimately go inside of our bodies. And, and we, we haven't even really begun the genetic revolution yet. We are just beginning to go down that path, genetic engineering, human genetic engineering, but also cybernetics, uh, um, human technology, uh, brain, brain, um, brain technology interfaces like um, uh, like Neuralink that uh, Elon Musk is developing. You know, in in some time in the near future, we will be engaging with the internet through our brains. Human beings are going to gradually become more more cybernetic, and uh, I think that ultimately we're going to face a post-human future uh, with with dire consequences. Uh, and I and by the way, I believe that all of this is, is predicted in the Bible. And so it's it, it comes as no surprise to me. And that's why I can I can see the trajectory going in this direction. And I think that you know the the transhumanism and post-humanism are are at some point going to converge with, with the revelation, the reality of the alien presence. In fact, I predict three things are even now converging and are going to uh, result in a radically different world than the one we're living in now. I predict that the what I call in my book the alien threat or the alien presence, that's if you can imagine these three things as three concentric circles, that are coming together, that are merging together. So one of these is, is the, the alien threat, the alien presence, revelation of that, the ongoing disclosure of that. Then you have transhumanism and, and, and this, this, this post-human future, all the technologies involved in that, the, the, the genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, all of the technologies that are going to give us the tools to radically, radically redesign our biology, okay? And then that third circle would be what I perceive as a new religion that's going to surface in the earth that's even now being formulated. I call it apotheotheism, and it's, I don't believe the future is atheist. I believe that, in, that a, a, apotheotheism will, will be the religion of the future, the concept of apotheotheism. It's a word that I coined myself, and it is a, an amalgamation of two terms— 
apotheosis, uh, rather apotheosis and theism. Theism obviously is the belief in gods, and apotheosis is the deification of man. So man becoming a god, and when you blend those two concepts together, what you have is a religion which acknowledges the existence of the gods, i.e., superior extraterrestrial entities or non-human entities, and the notion that mankind can become like a god ourselves through the agency of technology. You blend those th two things together and you have a new religion, apotheotheism, and I believe that is a religion of the future. So these are the three concentric circles that I see merging, and when these things come together, as they come together, we are going to be seeing a radical uh, alteration of human society, radical radical alteration of human biology and human society even the way that we interact with technology will be radically different in the future and the future is post-human yeah no i that's a beautiful thought in general i mean i hope so at least in terms of if we survive it and i think that we're not talking about necessarily extinction of humanity but the evolution of humanity you know and what then this advanced technology will lead to you know i have the opinion that we are closer to cavemen than we are closer to being at the uh, pinnacle of technological advancement. And I think when you look at it through that lens, then what you just said makes total sense. Now, my last question related to that would be, oh, Joe, go ahead. I was gonna say, well, if you are a secular humanist, the prospect of becoming post-human may be exciting. But if you care about preserving humanity at all, genetically speaking, uh, uh, you might even say, consciously speaking, psychically speaking, if you if you care about preserving humanity at all, then it is then it's a very frightening prospect. The idea mm -hmm. of us losing our humanity, those trademarks that make us Homo sapiens, losing those trademarks. Uh, I think, certainly biblically speaking, there are some uh, there are some exceedingly grave consequences associated with that. So if you're not concerned with preserving humanity, there's no reason why we shouldn't become post-human. It would seem like natural progression of evolution by natural selection, right? But in this case, it would be directed evolution. If you are concerned with, with preserving humanity, if there is any reason whatsoever to preserve human humanity, and really there's two questions here, what does it mean to be a human being and is our humanity worth preserving? Depending how I, how you answer those questions, I th think will determine your outlook in regard to post post-humanism. Yeah, and that kind of leads to my follow-up, which is um, from the moral standpoint, like where do you think humanity has to get to to ensure our continued existence regarding this post-human uh, apocalypse or world that you know, we combine ourselves with the technology because in my mind, I don't think we're there yet from a moral standpoint. What, what are your views on that? Well, it depends on what your worldview is, what your paradigm is. Again, I'll refer to my own. If you're coming from a biblical paradigm, then then the consequence of of evolving out of Adam, let's say, are dire, are grave. There's, I believe there's some very dynamic things that will happen in the earth if we forfeit, and that's why my book is called Birthright, by the way, if we forfeit our birthright, our human birthright. Um, uh, but even in just, even just considering though, the, the integration of our biology with technology, you're, you're going to fundamentally change what it means to be a human being. So you're going into a, a landscape that is completely uncertain. And by the way, add into this, add into this equation. Um, and this is, really part of that circle that encompasses transhumanism and posthumanism is robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, that's a whole nother thing that's developing. Uh, and, and so I see a future in which we can't hardly control ourselves now with the level of technology that we have. If, if we are given more power to destroy the earth, to destroy each other, to oppress to if we give government more power, our governments, any government, pick any government you want on planet Earth. If you give them more power, more technological power, more control, they're just going to become more tyrannical. You're just going to lose more of your freedom. They're going to use these tools against us for sure to control us. And uh, that's so people who love freedom uh, and are independent 
I think the advancement of technology, I'm not a Luddite. There's, there's a levels at which there's degrees of technological advancement that are, that are absolutely necessary. Medical advancement, for example. Uh, there's, there's degrees of, of um, defense technology and so forth that I'm obviously very much in favor of. But there's a, we're going to cross a line at some point in the future. When you begin to modify human biology, human psychology, when you begin to use these technologies to go beyond what's beneficial to society, uh, for example, that, that, that point, we're going to reach that point with artificial intelligence. It's, it, 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 there's, there's some, there, there's, there is some future in which artificial intelligence does become dangerous um, and, and a threat to the human species. And, and when that, where that threshold is, I don't know. But certainly Elon Musk is concerned about that. That's why he's trying to develop Neuralink so that we can that we can keep pace with artificial intelligence, which he rightly understands as this exponential. Uh, once we once we let this thing loose, artificial intelligence is going to be teaching itself, upgrading itself, and it's going to and it's going to get out of control. It's almost inevitable, you know. And, and th there's something called the inevitability inevitability thesis, or or. It's also called the technological impairment, uh, imperative. And, and what that means is what it proposes is that once a, a useful technology is, de is introduced into society, what follows is the inevitable development of that technology. It, that technology will be developed to its maximum utility. It's for sure and nothing will stop it. That includes artificial intelligence. That includes human genetic engineering. That includes the the brain interfacing technologies. That includes weapon building weapons. It, it it applies to everything. So, you know, we've introduced all of these new technologies, and it's all in its infancy. And, and all of this is going to get out of control really fast, I think. And and so, is it just that we have a bleak future? No, because again, I'm going to revert back to my own perspective, which is a biblical perspective. The end of the book is actually very, very, very positive, depending on what your allegiance is. And so I'm, I don't have just this apocalyptic, bleak view of the future, but at the same time, I understand where all of this is headed. And it's yeah. going to get pretty chaotic, I think. The AI thing is what scares me a lot, keeps me up. There seems like there's a lot of ways where things can may not go well for us from the humanity perspective. So um, kind of, I guess, one last bonus question here is, what is your thoughts on our uh, humanity in general? I mean, what I'm getting at, I guess, is that there are a few theories out there. One of them is like the prison planet theory, uh, the idea that we've been reset in the past. Do you have any thoughts on that kind of related to all of this and what you've kind of learn throughout your time on this earth and being investigating phenomenon? That you mean genetically? Uh, I think that like from like, I'm thinking of stuff like Graham Hancock talking about like ancient apocalypse. There's being like oh, these flood myths okay. that are out there in right. terms of like civilization having agree. been reset. Yeah. Or, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I absolutely concur with that. I think there were, it, it is, and I'm going to use them, although it's, there's some confusion here. I do believe there was, there was an advanced civilization inhabiting the earth. How advanced? I don't know. Um, perhaps even using a different track of technology that we have today, an advanced civilization inhabiting the earth that was obliterated in a global cataclysm. I absolutely affirm that. I think there's a lot of, a lot of evidence for that. And, and I myself have, have, have been exploring that question for, for more than a decade. So I, I would concur with Graham um, that there was an advanced civilization on planet Earth at one time, universal, I think, to some extent. Um, and maybe there were some survivors. Interesting. So, well, I think that this is probably a good time to wind it up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Timothy Amberino, for being on Hard Truths. Is there anything that you want to plug here uh, for the folks that have been watching? And I just want to thank you as well very much for your time. Um, you can get my book, Birthright, The Coming Post-Human Lips and the Usurpation of Adam's Dominion on Planet Earth, if, you, if you're interested in my, my perspective on some of the things we talked about. Um, my YouTube channel, Timothy Alberino, and I'm on, I'm on X and uh, Instagram. My handle is always the same, Timothy Alberino, no spaces, no dots. And thanks a lot for having me on. It's, it's, it was, it's been my pleasure, Ashton. Yeah, this was an awesome conversation. Let's uh, be in touch for sure, just because uh, I think we see eye to eye on a lot of topics out there. And I'd just
just like to be in touch with you and figure out what's next in general. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Timothy Ambrino, mm -hmm. for being on Hard Truths. Thank you, sir. Okay. I'm going to... Okay. Well, thank you guys very much as well for everyone who is uh, on here today and being on Hard Truths. This is the area where we go and we seek those hard truths. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast.